Yes. Yeah. So it's my great pleasure to introduce today Anthony Lee from Bristol University. Uh, Anthony is uh, someone working on computational statistics. He made uh, wrote quite a few uh, great papers on MCMC and particle filters. Check his web page. Most uh, all his papers are super interesting. And he's going today to give the um, second part of uh, Christophe Andreu's talk last week, where uh, they propose a very general uh, framework for understanding metropolis algorithms, which makes you uh, better understand uh, why certain algorithms are actually valid. Uh, so it's a very interesting framework. And uh, without further ado, Anthony, uh, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to see people coming to the second part because hopefully I can expand a bit on some of the, the, the framework that Christoph introduced last week um, with some examples that are a little bit more complicated, uh, but that, you know, therefore somehow maybe more interesting um, than the ones he covered, especially ones which, which people have at least in the past expressed um, some difficulty understanding some of the proofs that people had provided in, in, in the past. I'm also happy to see that Sam Livingston is also uh, attending. So all of the authors of this paper are, are here. Okay, so I'll just briefly go over the framework first, and then uh, I'll try and talk briefly about deterministic proposals, but mainly with a view to, to uh, talking briefly about you know, standard HMC. And then I'll go on to the more interesting bit, at least for today, which is about uh, how to incorporate proposals that may involve at least intuitively stopping times or involving proposals that are stopped processes before looking at Markov chain proposals, what, what we call nuts like kernels, because they're basically like nuts, but you know, just slightly more general. And then if I have time, I'll talk briefly about multiple try and just comment on how it's related to uh, pseudo marginal scheme. Okay, so the framework just to recap what Christoph talked about uh, last uh, last week, so the the idea is we're gonna we're gonna assume that we've got some probability measure mu, um, which admits pi as a marginal. So we're gonna say if psi is distributed according to mu, then we'll assume that there's some sort of identifiable component psi naught which is distributed according to pi. And then the only other thing we need to do is to define some kind of involution, uh, which we'll call phi, right? Um, and then those two components really are sort of the most important of the, of the three. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk, start talking about an acceptance function, but, but you just need mu and phi to define the acceptance ratio that you will use in a Metropolis Hastings type algorithm. Okay, so just some notation, if we denote by uh, nu uh, superscript of our phi, the push forward of nu by phi. So, if, you know, if you, if you don't if you're not familiar, then basically, you know, phi of psi is distributed according to the push forward of mu by phi, right? Phi of psi is uh, distributed according to the push forward of mu by phi if psi is distributed according to mu. Okay, and then the whole uh, sort of the, 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 the big thing that um, Christoph introduced uh, last week is sort of, you know, one way to, 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 to look at uh, validity is that if is that you can define the acceptance ratio r of psi to be basically uh, d mu uh, phi by d mu at, at psi, so the Radonikian derivative of mu phi against mu, um, which is basically you can rewrite in a in a sort of easy to evaluate way as rho composed with phi at psi divided by rho of psi multiplied by some sort of uh, change of measure. Um, component here, okay, where rho is the density of mu with respect to some uh, reference measure lambda, uh, which is equivalent um, uh, when pushed forward. Okay, so that, 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 that may seem a little bit technical, but in fact, I think in all the cases that I'll talk about today, you will choose lambda to be something friendly, like, like the Lebesgue measure or a, or a variant, a Markov chain measure or something, and it will usually be the case that lambda phi is in fact equal to lambda, right? So that in fact, this term is just one and you don't need to worry about it. And the important thing is that what you need to do is evaluate the density um, uh, rho at phi of psi and also at psi, or you can imagine evaluating that density. Okay, so that's the framework. 
Um, and the basic, so one basic algorithm, in some sense, that acceptance ratio defines uh, a single Markov kernel that tries to replace psi with phi of psi. So that's all it does. So it, in some sense, it doesn't do very much. There's only two possible points. But, but one way to define a basic algorithm is to sort of cycle uh, two kernels. So first, let's just let A be uh, an acceptance function. Christoph went over the sort of precise requirements for the acceptance function last week. I don't want to get into it. Uh, basically, one possible acceptance function is, is corresponding to the standard metropolis hasting scheme, uh, which is A of R is equal to the minimum of 1 and R. And what you can do as an algorithm is at psi naught, right? You can sample uh, psi minus 0 according to the conditional, basically, of all of the other components of psi according to mu given psi naught. And then you can accept this sort of new uh, this new version of psi, phi of psi, with probability a of r of psi. Okay, and again, it's the same acceptance ratio as, 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 as before. So you can think of it basically as a cycle of two kernels. P naught basically fixes psi naught and refreshes psi minus zero. Um, and P phi basically attempts to replace uh, psi with phi of psi. Okay, and it turns out, as Christoph also mentioned last week, that this is a, that in fact defines a pi reversible uh, Markov chain only on the psi naught component. Okay, but that's not the main the main thrust of today. This is just to sort of show that you know you, it, it's useful this 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 type of thing um, when you when you combine uh, the sort of p phi kernel, which is mainly what we focus on, um, with some other kernel that 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 leaves your target invariant, that leaves mu invariant. Okay, so just as an example, we can look at the random walk metropolis. Christoph covered this last week, but it's sort of relevant for one of the examples later. You imagine mu has density rho xv with respect to the bag, right, which is given by pi of x times q of v. You assume that q of minus v is equal to q of v for all v. And then you imagine your, your involution being um, xv goes to x plus v minus v. Okay, this is a, this is a, um, Lebesgue preserving uh, transformation. So you don't need to worry about the, the d lambda phi by d lambda. Um, and indeed, it is an involution. OK, so you obtain that r of xv is basically just rho of phi of xv divided by rho of xv. You use the fact that actually these guys are equal, and you obtain the sort of familiar pi of x plus v divided by pi of x. Okay. And so one thing I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, go on about it too much, but in some sense you can think of uh, if someone gives you a kernel and it looks complicated, what you can do is you can ask yourself, well, is there a mu phi uh, corresponding to the acceptance ratio, right? And in, and in particular, one something that's nice is that it doesn't matter what mu and phi you pick, the acceptance ratio is defined, right? But it may be it. it it may be zero everywhere, or maybe zero in many places, but basically the, there is an acceptance ratio that corresponds to using that combination of mu and phi. Okay, so here's a slightly more interesting example, just because someone asked the question, I think David asked the question last week, what about the exchange algorithm? So I'm not going to get into too many details, but the idea is that actually you can prove very, very easily that the exchange algorithm is, is, uh, is valid and that it, it leaves pi invariant. Um, in this case, you have pi of theta, say, uh, uh, proportional to some prior density for theta times some uh, likelihood, um, fy theta divided by z of theta, where z of theta basically normalizes the, 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 the density of y. Okay, you can't compute z uh, of theta, so you have to come up with an algorithm to take you around that. Uh, what they basically propose is you can think of it as psi is theta theta prime and x, right? Where under, under mu, uh, theta comes from pi of theta, uh, theta prime comes from q theta theta prime, some proposal kernel, and then x comes from, uh, the, uh, comes from the distribution given theta prime. Okay, so you can write it out like this as well. And then you observe that you're gonna try, well, basically you can try and think of the involution theta theta prime x maps to theta prime theta x. Okay, and then after you just do a bit of algebra, uh, you find the acceptance ratio is given by this expression, which is the same expression as that is proposed in the exchange algorithm paper. Um, and that's correct. Okay, so there's no, 
there's no kind of additional uh, work to do. And, and in particular, it's it's quite a transparent and simple um, uh, mu and psi. It's not infinite dimensional, even though I think in the original exchange paper, there was an appeal to an infinite dimensional process, but but you don't need to do that. You can just, uh, you can just do it like this um, with, with, with no worries. Okay, and you can also treat and extend other algorithms that are in this sort of family, including the single auxiliary variable method of uh, Muller and co-author. Okay, so I'll move on now to maybe something a little bit different. So here we're gonna think about deterministic mappings um, to some extent. We don't need to get into too many details, but uh, it's sort of important to think, well, what about sort of proposals that involve these, these kind of deterministic maps? Then I'm gonna call, um, I'm gonna consider maps that I'll call reversible, but I mean this not in the sense of reversible Markov kernels, I mean that they're reversible in the sense that you can kind of invert them in some sense. Okay, so you can take this map, uh, psi of xv uh, maps to x plus v and v, and you can consider an involution phi, which is basically sigma composed with psi, where sigma is, 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 is a mapping that basically flips the sign of v. Okay, and, and if you do, if you look at that a little bit, you'll see that actually phi is the random walk metropolis involution that we considered a couple of slides ago. So it's easy to see that actually P of phi is mu reversible. Okay, where mu has the uh, density given by this, you know, basically the same density we consider in the random walk metropolis. Okay, but you can also see that this, this kernel, which I'll sort of define in a slightly cheeky way of, as P psi, which is basically the cycle of P phi and P sigma, where P sigma just flips the sign, right? Uh, P sigma is also mu invariant and it has acceptance probability one, if you like. And that defines a mu invariant kernel, but it's not mu reversible. Okay, so if, 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 if you imagine, if you think about what, what, what would happen in a simple setting, um, you're, you're gonna try and accept reject XV maps to X plus V uh, minus V. Uh, because that's what phi does. It tries to accept x plus v minus v, and then it tries to flip whatever the outcome of that accept reject is. Okay, so basically, if it's accepted, your overall move is x plus uh, x v goes to x plus v b, um, and otherwise, if 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 the first uh, attempt, if this bit is is rejected, you're you're going to move to x v. Um, well, x v moves to x minus v. Okay, and in fact, this is the guided random walk of uh, Gustafsson introduced in, in, in 1998. Okay, and if you imagine, well, this, this is basically telling you that you can define kernels that sort of move you, uh, move you according to this psi, which is, which is maybe in, 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 in some sense uh, more um, easy to think about because you're really trying to move constantly in this direction V until you reject at, at, at some point. Okay, and uh, that's mainly just a stepping stone, uh, kind of stepping stone, so we can talk about uh, HMC. So I think of HMC as actually being very similar to this kind of guided random walk. Uh, in this case, instead of uh, pi times uh, pi times q, you let rho be uh, pi pi times kappa. So um, you let uh, lambda be the the Lebesgue measure and kappa be a normal distribution, and you have some kind of slightly more sophisticated mapping compared to the Gustafson one, where psi is basically the composition of, of, of three maps, uh, psi b, psi a, and, and, and psi b again. And in fact, you'll probably iterate this map capital L times, okay, for, for capital L being greater than one. Okay, and we don't need to get into the specific details of HMC, uh, but basically you can think of psi a as being something that moves x by some function of b and leaves v fixed. Uh, you can think of psi b as something that moves v by some function of x uh, and leaves x fixed, okay? And those are like translations in, in the corresponding components that move. Okay, and then you can consider this involution uh, phi is sigma composed with uh, uh, psi to the L. You can, you can easily see by, by the nature of, of psi, psi a and psi b that in fact um, phi is volume preserving uh, because psi a and psi b are, are, are volume preserving. So you have composition of many volume preserving maps, that's fine. So that means it kind of preserves Lebesgue. And you can also see that you have a kind of reversibility structure uh, 
if you impose this condition, which is of course satisfied by the standard HMC leapfrog map. Okay. So what that says is that basically, if you want to write down what the acceptance ratio should be, well, it's going to be exactly just this component because of, because the volume preserving part says that this component is, is, is one. Okay, and this is basically just saying you just look at the, 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 the target density at where you go to divided by the target density at where you start. Okay, so that's how you can incorporate these kind of de deterministic maps if you like. Okay, so due to the structure of the non-reversible kernel, there's also things you can do if you prefer to never think about this kind of involution, you can also think of it purely in terms of the size that's completely fine. Uh, once again, you'll find that the that the size are volume preserving, basically, because because uh, well, the size are also volume preserving, as as I said on the last slide. Okay. So one thing that will become interesting for for some of the motivation for nuts, which we'll talk about soon, is that in some sense that's a nice algorithm. Of course, it's it's very celebrated. It's used uh, all over the place. Um, uh, but what is maybe difficult or not obvious uh, when when you look at the at, at the sort of um, specification is how you should set L the sort of number of steps for your leapfrog, um, for your velocity verlay integrator or your, or your um, number of leapfrog steps. Okay, but there's also some other comments which I think are interesting in and of themselves, which are that the proof of validity, which basically I've outlined here, um, it doesn't say anything about whether the algorithm is good. It just says that it leaves mu invariant, right? And in particular, I didn't even specify the, 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 the real HMC algorithm. I specified this, this kind of setting with the constraint that, that you have this, this, this equality. And there's plenty of very bad um, kind of mappings that would fall into that class that, that, um, that, that would also be uh, valid, but probably not nearly as good as the HMC that we all know and love. And there's nothing about step sizes or anything like that either. Okay. Okay. So now I'll try and move on to uh, stopping times and stop processes. I think that's where um, some of the novelty uh, is because that's something where maybe like basically all the uh, all the algorithms we've talked about so far, people have sort of proofs and people have arguments. Certainly for HMC, there's very good proofs. I mean, we are not you know proving HMC is correct because no one knew. Um, you know, but the but the stopping time stuff is something where it's, it's not so easy to go line by line and, and, and understand some of the proofs that are in the literature. Okay, so here let's, let's imagine like a simple sort of toy problem just to get started uh, where we wanna use say a, a random number of proposals because maybe we have a kind of hard target, okay? And maybe simulating several proposals is, 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 is not too expensive, but we believe that, you know, if we were to do a standard independent Metropolis Hastings, it wouldn't work very well. So we're gonna, we're gonna consider a sort of multi-proposal independent Metropolis Hastings. We're gonna let psi be n, z, and k, where under mu, uh, z naught comes from pi, z, um, actually z should be, uh, z should include z one, uh, z naught as well. Sorry, that's a typo. Uh, z naught comes from pi, z is basically a, a sequence of lots of random variables. And uh, z, but z1 and z2 and z3 and so on are, are new distributed. Okay, so they're distributed according to new instead of pi. And if we let this sort of var pi be the, oops, be the Radonikodim derivative between pi and new, um, and then so, so we'll define that and then we'll just say, well, let's stop uh, when, once, once some kind of stopping criterion. Is, is, is satisfied. So let's let, let tau of z be the smallest n such that Sn of z is equal to one. Okay. And in some sense, th th this is to make the notation cleaner. You can make clear that Sn of z should only depend on z zero up to zn, for example, right? But you know, just, just to keep things clean, let's 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 do this. Okay. So then we'll set n to be tau of z. And then we'll simulate uh, some, some random variable k according to some distribution that depends on n and z. Okay. And then one natural involution that you can consider after doing this is basically uh, phi will map nzk to tau 
of uh, sigma k of z. Um, it'll map z to sigma k of z, and it'll map k to k. And what does sigma k do? Well, sigma k just swaps uh, z naught and z k in 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 z. Okay. So of course, once in in basically sigma k of z, um, sigma k of z naught. Maybe I should write it. Sigma k of z naught will be equal to z k. Okay. Okay, so then we can try and work out what 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 the acceptance ratio would be. Um, it's not too difficult to think about uh, what um, what what lambda should be. It should be the product of two counting measures and new infinity, uh, where new infinity is basically the kind of infinite um, uh, product measure of probability uh, of probability measures which exists. Okay, and so the acceptance ratio is just going to be uh, given by rho composed with phi divided by rho. Which you can which you can work out as being basically just 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 this these quantities because most of the um, uh, most of the terms that you would imagine might appear cancel out okay in some sense okay but you can be careful and talk about the right and derivatives if you prefer okay so this looks a little bit complicated but 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 already you can see that you can probably calculate this right um, in, in in some circumstances. Um, and if you want to think about a nice uh, specific situation, you could let, for example, uh, this distribution for k uh, weight um, uh, weight uh, z well, weight k with probability proportional to var pi of z k um, as long as k is within the, the set zero to n. Okay, you can do lots of other things. You could exclude zero, for example. That would make sense, but it would be a bit more complicated. Okay, and then you're going to get an acceptance ratio that looks like the ratio of uh, several uh, of uh, the ratio of sums of these Radonikodim derivatives. Okay, as long as k is indeed less than n and n prime. So, if you sample from mu, obviously k will be uh, less than or equal to n, but you know you need to be careful that n prime is not going to be too large because n prime is basically the stopping time that you would obtain after you swap. Uh, Z0 and, and Zk, right? And there's no guarantee that it would always be the same. Okay, does that make sense? Basically, when you're doing your, your after you've done your involution, you have to consider what would the value of n be after I sort of uh, do that transformation to, to, to Z, to get Z prime. Can you hear me, Anthony? Yeah. Oh, because I tried to speak uh, two minutes ago and it didn't work. So, uh, ah yeah no I wasn't I I I, I wasn't ignoring you that's uh... okay I I was wondering I'm sorry uh, I missed something uh, why do you need to consider an infinite number of random variables so just I mean you don't need to but but you can right so one thing um, you can do is you can define this z this z to be an, an infinite sequence of new distributed random variables and then you define tau of z to be a, basically a kind of stopping time um, corresponding to that sequence. Uh, you yes, also okay. do it as a stopped process, whereby you would encode the kind of stopping. Um, but it does, it, it can be a little bit more complicated, especially in this situation where there's no guarantee that n prime and n will be the same. And it, it leads to a bit of gymnastics, basically. And so you want to sample, sample until some criterion is met. That's the idea. Yeah, exactly. You want to sample until some criterion and um, is 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 met, and somehow it, I think it's a bit more transparent because these things are valid things to do. You can define the Radonikodim derivative between um, certain uh, uh, infinite dimensional probability measures. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So one thing that's important, obviously, is that when you when you implement the algorithm you don't actually simulate from the conditional associated with mu because as, as, as Nicola just said, this is some kind of infinite dimensional uh, probability measure which would involve sampling an infinite number of random variables. Nobody, nobody has the time to do that, right? So instead, you can imagine that in order to actually um, perform the, the, that in order to actually identify whether you will accept the move and also to know what the new value of psi naught is, it's sufficient to only simulate uh, the maximum of n and n prime random variables. And even less in some cases. If you imagine, if, if you notice that k 
uh, was 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 all was already. No, no, no. I think basically you you probably just need to simulate the maximum of n and n prime n variables. Okay. So in some sense, you know, what you write down as your as your algorithm need not correspond exactly to what you implement, which is almost necessary in the context where mu uh, contains a uh, uh, distribution which would take infinite time to actually simulate. Okay, so that's fine. Um, uh, in practice, it can actually be nice if n prime was equal to n. So that's to say, what if we could make it so that the stopping time associated with the sort of um, uh, transformed z was basically the same as the stopping time associated with the with with the initial z. And if you think about it, it turns out that this is basically imposing conditions on why you stop. Okay, so there's lots of there's lots of trivial ways to, to do that by making sort of stopping time independent of the of the of the z's and introducing auxiliary variables. But one thing that actually is kind of useful or or interesting in practice is to define uh, stopping um, stopping uh, functions that basically um, satisfy these properties. So one is that no matter what z is, um, skz is non-decreasing. And, and if you remember what we've talked about so far is that these sks are 0, 1 valued. Um, th there are ways to extend that, but for, but for today we can call, talk about these 0, 1 valued sks. It means that basically as k increases, you go from all zeros basically then to just all ones. Right? There's no sort of oscillation between 0 and 1. Um, the second condition is that sk of z should be equal to sk of uh, sigma l of z for any l in, in, in 1 to k. Right? So this says that if I was to swap some of the components of z, I would, I would have the same value of uh, sk as long as uh, that l is less than, less than r equal to k. Um, and basically, here is the more interesting one. Basically, that you should uh, you should um, draw k in some sense from a distribution supported on zero to n minus one. So it's n minus one and 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 not n basically. Okay, so I'm not going to get into all the details of, of of this, but I'll try and give like some kind of high level idea. And here's some examples. So here's an example of a good stopping criteria uh, or a criteria that 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 satisfies these conditions. You could say let s k z uh, be the indicator that the sum of, say, the right indicative derivatives exceeds c. But actually, this could be almost any kind of non-negative function of, 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 of the z's. OK, so you can let skz be this kind of indicator that some sum exceeds c. OK, it's easy to see that this is going to be non-decreasing because this is non-negative. These var pi's are non-negative. You can see that swaps don't matter because this is basically um, invariant to permutations of, of, these, of these guys. Um, and this is something that is for later. Okay, but you know you can also consider um, different types of stopping criterion that actually don't uh, satisfy these conditions. So, for example, if you were to instead of uh, using something like this, you wanted to use some kind of measure of the effective sample size. Um, you know, basically it's something to do with uh, uh, squared weights and weight squared and so on. Um, there's there, there's no guarantee that that SKZ is is uh, non-decreasing. Because in fact, it can go from zero to one and then to zero again, for example. Okay, so I won't get into all the details, except that somehow, um, if you look at the proofs, one of the high level ideas that, that you can imagine is that uh, it's okay to swap things that, that occur before the stopping time, because they cannot affect the stopping time if they occur before the stopping time when you have this kind of condition. Okay, and when you have this kind of condition as well. Okay, so that's sort of a simple, a simple sort of setting, and you can imagine that you could, you could, you could implement now a kind of multiple proposal IMH, which basically tries to propose more samples. Um, uh, maybe when you have, uh, uh, you know, when you're when you're at a place that has a very high Radnikov derivative, potentially. Okay, uh, so now I'll talk about Markov chain proposals, which are. Uh, slightly, slightly more complicated. There's a bit of dependence, maybe, in in in, in the random variables that that, that you propose. Um, in in the previous example, it was fairly simple because the z1, z2, and so on were iid from new. Now let's consider something which is only slightly more complicated, which is that 
you have some kind of two-sided, uh, you, you, you think about some kind of two-sided Markov chain, okay, which has these parameters k, pi, q, and q star. Um, and the way it works is that zk, so this is where k comes in and pi comes in, zk is distributed according to pi. And for all i greater than one, if you look to the right, you start, um, those random variables are distributed according to q. And if you look to the left, or you look you know, to smaller indices, uh, they are distributed according to Q star of the, of, the, of, the, of the point that is in front of them or to the right of them. Okay, so this defines basically a kind of Markov chain where you have some kind of uh, distribution for ZK and then the, the you know, going right and going left, uh, the, the random variables um, are, are distributed according to Markov kernels. Okay, and so we'll call the measure of this, of, of, of a K pi Q Q star chain uh, capital lambda k, um, and we'll assume here. I mean, there's there's also ways you can make this a bit simpler, although not probably so much in the in the infinite horizon setting. Um, you can make settings so that basically let's let, let's just assume that basically q and q star uh, both leave new invariant, and they are and that q star is basically the time reversal of q. Okay, and vice versa. Okay, so if you do that, then actually you get a very simple form for the Radonikian derivative of these uh, um, Markov chain pro Markov chain probability measures, which is basically that um, the Radonikian der derivative of lambda k uh, with respect to lambda zero, right, where pi, um, where basically z naught should be distributed according to pi, is given by basically the ratio of, of the Radonikian derivatives. Um, of pi and nu at zk and at z0. Okay, so that's nice, even though you have this kind of infinite dimensional object. Okay, and basically this, this is only well defined on a specific set where basically those, those values are, are, are not zero. Okay, so that's something to just say, well, well we can talk about these sort of, uh, we can talk about Radonikian derivatives between Markov chain measures and so here, let's have an idea for a kind of uh, proposal that uses these Markov chains. So one idea, let's, uh, let's have an idea where psi is z and k at z0. Um, so, so, so under mu, let's imagine that z0 is distributed according to pi um, and, and, that, and that the rest of mu says, well, z minus zero. So all of the rest of z should be distributed according to q and q star, depending on if you're going forwards or you're going backwards. Okay, so you, you kind of realize this Markov chain according to basically lambda, lambda zero, and then you sample uh, some K with some probability that depends on this infinite uh, Markov chain. Okay, and then no matter how you've done that, although of course there's better ways and, 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 and less good ways, um, you, sh you can basically consider this involution, uh, you send Z to theta k of z, which is basically a shift of z by k k places, um, and then you consider mapping k to minus k. Okay, so basically here theta k is a shift operator, so that if you look at theta k of z at zero, it will be z k. Okay, you can imagine you're actually shifting everything to the left, basically. Okay, so you can do that. Um, you've now got like this whole Markov chain, which which constitutes proposals that you might consider. And basically the acceptance ratio will be just given by this, this, this ratio of the Radonikian derivatives, which is basically the ratio of uh, lambda k, lambda zero, and then the ratio of the sort of um, probabilities of choosing minus k when you're at the shifted process and the probability of using k when you're in the, when you're in the z, z uh, process. Okay. And of course, it's nice to think of a specific example. So let's just imagine we have an example where we choose the probability um, of choosing k is equal to i to be basically proportional to uh, var pi of zi multiplied by some indicator that we're in a kind of suitable window, right? So a window from minus tau to tau where tau is uh, just a deterministic constant, for example. Okay, so then you'll find that actually the acceptance ratio r of psi will be the ratio of, uh, of um, of sums of these uh, var pi's at z i's, but the z i's are summed over different windows. Okay, and that's because of that sort of shifted process 
Um, once I shift, I look at sort of town places to the right and town places to the left of, 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 of where I had shifted. All right, so this is like that nod, but maybe I choose K to be here. So um, I have to look basically up, up there and up there. Oops. Uh, you know, tau, 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 tau. So basically the, the, what you might consider as being the windows are not exactly the same. So you're not gonna get an acceptance ratio that's exactly equal to one, which is neither good or bad. It's just sort of, that's, that's just uh, something that, 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 that you can see. Okay, so we can think of uh, ways we could make maybe the windows be the same. In fact, you can do that by just sort of considering some some additional randomization. And this isn't for this isn't for nothing. Most of what I'm talking about now is building up to nuts, basically. Okay, so if you want to make the windows the same, one thing you can do is you can randomize the endpoints. So you have to introduce yet one more uh, variable into your psi. We now have psi being ZLK, okay, and we define Z forwards and backwards as before. So Z naught is distributed according to, to pi, right, and then you have your sort of infinite Markov chain going backwards and forwards, okay, but the interesting thing that we're going to do is, is in order to define our window, instead of just using tau, uh, like minus tau and, and plus tau, we're going to define this L, we're going to sample L to be a, a uniform on zero to m minus one, and we'll define a size m window um, as minus l to r, where r is m minus one minus l. Okay, so when you include z zero, that becomes a, a, a window with m points in it. Okay, and then you can define the involution. Well, let's send z again to uh, shifted, let's just shift z uh, so, that, uh, so that the shifted z zero is basically zk. Um, let's send L to L plus K and K to minus K. So basically what you're doing is you're just shifting. Um, you're kind of shifting the window. Uh, so basically the L that you choose for the original process is not the L that you choose for the um, shifted process, right? Which, which is exactly what allows you to make them equal. Okay, and you can see, in fact, if I look at theta K, Z at minus L plus K, well, that's just gonna be Z minus L theta k at z um, uh, m minus 1 minus l plus k is going to be z m minus 1 minus l is equal to z r. So in both cases, you can see that actually the, the, the points that you consider when you sample um, when you sample uh, according to uh, this, this bar sigma, they can be the same if you like. Okay, so if, for example, you were to choose um, uh, so that's a typo. Uh, uh, in the window, right? If 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 you choose bar sigma of i given z to be proportional to uh, bar pi of z i, and and z i is is in the corresponding window, it's between l and r, then we will obtain uh, an acceptance ratio of one. Okay, but of course there it's because you're assuming that you might, oops, um, uh, you can choose the same point that you started with. Otherwise you'll get a ratio that's slightly different if you're a bit more clever. Okay. Okay, so now I think we're in a good position to start talking about nuts. Some of the, some of the finer details. It, if you like, so one of the questions that is asked when you, um, when, well, one of the questions that was asked by the authors of this paper, Hoffman and Gelman, when they introduced nuts is, um, well, how can we maybe choose the right number of steps? And maybe how can we do it in a kind of adaptive way where we don't need to pre-specify a, a given uh, sort of number of steps? And it, it's, it's a very interesting, very interesting and, and appealing idea. And so what they say is, well, maybe it would be good to stop um, basically expanding this uh, HMC trajectory forwards and backwards in time um, uh, once it sort of starts to turn back on itself. So I've got a picture on, 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 on the next, on the next uh, page. And basically, you can basically boil that down to a very simple condition involving the sort of right endpoint and the left endpoint and, and, the, and the velocities or the momenta associated with those points. 
Okay, so we're, we'll, we'll, we'll consider here just a simple version of their um, algorithm in the slice sampler case, which is called the simple algorithm in, in, in their paper. And we will use for the for the doubly infinite Markov chain a sort of deterministic Markov chain, right? Which is defined by this uh, QZ, DZ prime is basically mapping using psi. Um, it, it moves Z to psi of Z, basically. And Q star moves uh, Z to uh, the inverse of psi of Z. Okay, and as we've seen before, Q and Q star preserve Lebesgue. Okay, so how do we define and verify a correct algorithm? Here's just a picture for the motivation. The idea is that here um, you're basically uh, moving, moving say, say this way, right to left. In some sense, it's it's not you know we don't need to let the geometry sort of um, bog us down. You can just think of this as something where like this is your z zero. You move right. Or, or you move left. It, it can be the case that obviously ZR is very close to Z minus L, but you know that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter M mathematically. And you can boil down their their kind of condition to basically stopping when um, if you move basically the the left point a little bit more to the left, then will it be closer to uh, XR than it currently is? And similarly for XR. If you were to move the right point slightly more to the right using its momentum, will it be closer to the left point um, than, 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 than before? Okay. So here we do something um, slightly more complicated, but really it's not that different to that, to that sort of uh, scheme where we sampled L from a uniform. In fact, marginally, it's, it's basically the same. Um, what, what we're going to do is we're going to under mu define this kind of uh, two-sided Markov chain just as before, except Q and Q star happen to be these deterministic things, but they don't have to be actually. For, for what I'm talking about now, it's, it's, it's very general, but if you want to think about nuts, you can think about the, the kind of deterministic setting. Okay, you can consider windows of states uh, defined by minus ln of B and Rn of B, where B is an infinite sequence of, of uh, Bernoulli half random variables defined in a simple way, which is that if, uh, if Bn is one, then you extend to the left, right? So your left point will be uh, sort of moved by two to the n minus one points to the left. And if, uh, and if, L, if, if uh, Bn is equal to zero, then you extend to the right and you keep the left uh, fixed, okay? So the idea is you're growing by a block of points to the left or the right. And the total size of, of, of the window at time n is always two to the n. Okay, and in fact, if you look at this, you're just marginally sampling um, ln from a uniform on two to the, uh, uh, that maybe should be two to the n minus one. Okay, um, and in fact, you can think of the, the, the sort of binary sequence as, as um, giving you the lns just in a sort of reversed binary representation. <clears throat> okay, so now, um, as before, this is very similar to some of the things that we've seen before. We're just going to stop according to some kind of uh, stopping rule. We're going to find tau to basically be the smallest n greater than or equal to one, such that Sn of Zb is equal to one, where we're going to impose some kind of conditions on exactly which kinds of Sn's we're going to allow. Okay, and in some sense, it's very similar to the multiple proposal IMH scheme, except that the actual conditions that they impose on the sort of natural quantities are sort of not not stringent at all, but they 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 kind of make the they they kind of make the whole procedure very robust by doing something quite 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 clever. Okay, so in particular, uh, this looks a bit busy, but just don't worry. Basically, MNB um, is 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 a midpoint in some sense of minus LNB and, and, and RNB. If you imagine, you're always imagining this kind of Z minus LNB up to Z uh, RNB. And we wanna choose MNB to be basically in the middle in such a way that there are two to the N minus one points in, in basically um, uh, minus LNB to MNB. And there are two to the N minus one points in, in MNB plus one to RNB. Okay, so it's just sort of uh, having um, having your points, okay? And it also has the property that actually 
uh, one of those uh, sort of subsequences will be exactly the previous sequence that 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 was considered. So either um, minus ln minus one b oops, uh, minus ln minus one b rn minus one b will be equal to minus ln b mn b, or um, it will be equal to mn b plus one rn b. Okay. And then they impose this kind of structure on, on, on the actual stopping rule. So Sn, Z of B should be basically uh, one if either of these functions is one. And this is the function that basically operates on the left sort of half and the right half. Okay, you can think of this midpoint as defining the sort of left half, left half, and this is the right half of, 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 of your points. So basically, you will apply this function f. Well, what is this function f? Actually, this function f uh, is always defined on, say, two to the k points. It always takes two to the k points. Okay, and it will it will evaluate one function g k on on those two to the k points, which could be zero or one. Um, but it will also evaluate recursively uh, f k minus one on the left half of those points and the right half of those points. So it will kind of recursively call um, the f. On, on its left half and, and, and right half, all the way down to the bottom. Um, and then at, at, if k is zero, it will just evaluate this g0 because there's nowhere else to go. It will, it will evaluate g0 on the only point it's given. Okay, so these kind of, uh, so basically the, the, the only thing that's free in this kind of setup is, is, the, choice of the, is the choice of the gk and it's these gk functions that really encode whether or not you should stop. Okay. Okay, so one thing you can do, so this is the bit, you know, it's not strictly speaking necessary to do it exactly this way, but for, for simplicity, we're gonna stop at time n, um, basically once, once Sn uh, Zb is equal to one, and we'll sample k uh, a proportional with the probability proportional to just to this indicator function, it has to be inside minus L n minus one B and R n minus one B. <coughs> and it has to be in the slice, you know, because this is like a slice sampler. But if that doesn't make a lot of sense, don't worry about it. It's mainly that, that you need to make sure that you're sampling within um, the sort of previous endpoints, not the time n endpoints, the, the time n minus one endpoints, which is very similar to the, uh, it's for a reason that's quite similar to the reasoning when we looked at the independent, uh, or when we looked at the multiple proposal IMH. Okay, and here we consider a very simple involution. We're gonna map Z to the shifted Z as usual, because we imagine we're, we're gonna, we wanna replace uh, Z zero with ZK. The way to make uh, Z zero and ZK sort of uh, look, um, sorry, the, the way to come up with a good uh, Markov chain that has very similar properties, but that k is in position zero is to shift it. Okay, so we shift it. We consider having the same stopping time, um, and we we do some transformation of the of the Bernoulli sequence, uh, which I'll go over. Which is basically very similar to what we did before when we wanted to make the windows the same. You kind of make it so that the Bernoullis will map to the same windows, and then we'll map k to minus k, which is basically that's because of the shift. Okay, and what we claim and what they claim, and it's true, is that R of psi is indeed equal to one if you, if you were to do this, which is to say that you will accept whatever move you propose. Okay, um, so just to check its involution, you can indeed see as before that the shifted uh, chain at zero is indeed ZK, right? And the shifted chain at minus K is indeed Z zero, so you will propose to move back. Um, I've, got, I've got a picture on the next slide which tries to go through at least visually why you can see this. It, it's not very complicated mathematically, but it's like there's just annoying uh, little bits that you need to do. Basically, if you define B prime to be this uh, chi n minus one K of B, then B prime does indeed define this, the same window around ZK uh, as B defines around Z zero at, at these two times, n minus one, time n minus one and, 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 and time n. Okay, uh, so, I, so I, I won't go into this bit, except that the whole point is just to show that <clears throat> when I look at Z prime at its uh, left endpoint at time n minus one up to its right endpoint, it will be exactly the same as, 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 the, as the original points. 
Okay. And what we'll end up doing, and the only thing that's really left is to basically check this later. Okay, so if you want to see the picture, well, basically, let's imagine you have uh, that, that your initial, um, that your B sequence that is, uh, that, that was simulated starts with 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, and let's imagine that it stops at, at time 4. Okay, so then you've got your Z0 here. Uh, your first B is zero, so you should move to the right by, you should include one point to the right, so that's Z1. Uh, your, next, your next B is one, so you should have two, uh, you should put a block of two to the left. Your next B is also one, so you should put a block of four again to the left. And your next B is zero, so you should put a block of eight to the right. Okay? So this is your block, and for whatever reason, you have stopped because your uh, S S4 of Z and B is basically one, okay? And let's imagine that you pick K to be minus four. Okay, so that's this guy. <coughs> so basically in order to define the, 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 the correct B prime, what you need to do is say, well, what, what, what is the B that would basically make L3 um, of, of, of B prime equal to two? Because basically I want there to be two uh, points to the left of Z minus four, and I want there to be whatever is remaining to, to, to the right. Okay, and it turns out that there's only one uh, B sequence of length three that will give you that, um, which I've alluded to before, because basically uh, these Bs give you like the binary representation of the number of points to the left. Okay, so in order for L3 of B, prime to be equal to two, you need to basically have the first three components be zero, one, zero, zero. And for the last one, actually, you just make sure that it's the same as for B, so that you know, you're at the same sort of window of points here, and you're gonna add exactly the same points that, uh, that, that were added in the original process, okay? So these can, things can all be written in a much more mechanical way, but I'm just trying to explain what's, what's, what, what's going on. Okay, so then once you've done that, we've, we've now got exactly the same windows. Um, we've got the same windows of states. And now the only thing we need to check really is, is uh, whether or not um, the stopping time will be the same forwards and backwards. Okay, and I guess I'm running uh, low on time, but, but, but the most important thing is that somehow you can show that basically Sn of Zb is greater than or equal to Sn minus one of Zb for any Z. This is like the sort of monotonicity property that I talked about before, but now in this nuts case. But the reason you have it in nuts is because of these recursive checks that, that you do, it kind of automatically imposes it, no matter what the Gs are, okay? And then there's a second thing which is uh, less important and is only for implementation details. But basically once, once, you've got, once you consider that you've got the same windows, you can see that actually if tau of psi was equal to n, it must mean that Sn minus one of Zb uh, is equal to zero, but that also must mean that Sn minus one of Z prime B prime is equal to zero because they define the same window, okay? And similarly, if tau of psi is equal to N, you know that Sn of Z prime and B prime is equal to Sn of Z and B, uh, Sn of Z and B is equal to one, right? Because those also define exactly the same windows. Okay, and then together with star, you know that basically SK of Z prime and B prime cannot be zero for any previous point because it's zero at time N minus one. Okay, and the second point is more of a sort of little trick that, 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 is, that, that people can use and is noted in the paper in some sense, <coughs> but not using this framework, of course. Okay, so I think I won't have time to talk about um, uh, uh, MTM and pseudo marginal, but I just wanted to point out that this, this nuts thing, in some sense, what I've gone over is a slightly more general scheme. There's no need for your Q and Q star to be deterministic. You can use sort of um, just new invariant Markov kernels if you like. And you can also look at uh, various different variations on nuts that have been proposed by, by, by the authors and also by the STAT team, because nuts, I think, has uh, evolved considerably since, since that paper. Okay, so just in terms of my final remarks, I think the important thing is somehow, hopefully what we've been able to convey over these two weeks is that looking at things in terms of mu and phi is very good, 
um, in terms of verifying whether or not your, your, your algorithm is correct and uh, deriving the actual acceptance ratio that, 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 that you can use. Um, obviously, it doesn't replace intuition and, and uh, ingenuity, which I think is behind lots of uh, the advances in, in, in these algorithms, but somehow it's a good tool maybe to actually help us uh, do away with some of the more difficult or technical aspects. Okay, and one thing I think it's very good in terms of um, allowing us to speak very clearly about what's happening when we use these stopping times, when we use sort of these sort of random numbers of, of, uh, of proposals or, or random variables in our algorithm. Okay, that's, that's, that's it for me. Thanks a lot. That was super interesting. I think I finally, finally understand that. <laughs> uh, I had a question myself, but uh, in case anyone else has a question, please let us know again by typing in the Q&A box. Uh, in the meantime, my question was, was this, I've seen these guys doing, uh, you know, the exchange algorithm in situation where you cannot sample exactly uh, the data uh, and you have some model and you're not able to simulate exactly uh, from the model and they will use uh, a long uh, a long run of the MCMC and just say it's an approximate method. But uh, if we use your framework with a Markov uh, proposal, maybe we can derive an exact algorithm for this kind of problem, no? Hmm. Like uh, you would use a G9 MCMC sampler for your proposal and you would pick up points inside the chain or? Yeah, I mean, I guess it would be interesting. I guess what's difficult is that it's because you have a perfect sample in those exchange like algorithms that you get the cancellation of the normalizing constants in the acceptance ratio. Whereas ah, yes, so you would still need to compute something which is intractable. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you, yeah. That, I mean, I think that's somehow the name of the game is there. I mean, it's possible that some kind of sophisticated choice of Markov. Um, you, you need maybe. a perfect sampler maybe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess that's an open question. Do you need an open sample? Uh, sorry, do you need a perfect sample or, or do you not? Mm. But certainly, I mean, I think this kind of framework helps to sort of try out ideas like that and, and see what happens. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. But do you have other application then for the, Rondo, for the Markov uh, proposal? Uh, for the Markov proposals, I think at the moment, we are still thinking about some um, interesting possibilities. It seems like it's, it's, it's a rich thing that, that could be, uh, um, exploited, but we haven't been working that much on that because we were trying to work on finishing the exposition of some of, some of these ideas, which actually we, we, we do know that there are several typos and we will be uh, fixing that, uh, fixing the paper and putting a new version up at some point. Oh, we have a question from Alex. Um, Alex, I don't see you saying anything about your mix. So I'm going to try to open your mic. Just give me one minute. Alex, you should be able to talk now. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for uh, this awesome talk. Um, I'm wonder I know that you didn't get to the pseudo marginal MH part, um, but I'm wondering about the fact that sometimes in pseudo marginal algorithms, we have to remember the previous estimate of pi of x, or that's how they're presented um, to use in the next iteration. In, in this framework, does that correspond to remembering some information in the other components of C or, um, yeah, how do you, how do you get that out of in, in this framework? Yeah, so there's several, so pseudo, so basically I don't actually cover the pseudo marginal in, in detail. I mainly cover, uh, cover MTM, but basically in the pseudo marginal setup, you usually have a target uh, that's like pi of phi, but basically you can evaluate pi of phi, you can only evaluate like uh, pi of phi and X say, Something like that. So in, in pseudo marginal methods, you can either carry around, um, well, you can come up with a psi and, in, and an involution that will carry around the previous estimate if you like. Uh, but there are other ways of just trying to carry around one x, um, which will basically give you some kind of some, some kind of estimate. But indeed, you don't know pi, and you can never evaluate pi exactly. I'm, I'm not sure if that if that's if that's clear enough, but basically. 
you can either include something like pi of x or like some kind of estimate uh, gamma phi of x i or something like that. Right, and and some of the are these all different strategies for justifying the same algorithm, or are they all different algorithms that you might think of as pseudo marginal like? I would say. Sorry, can you ask the question again? I don't think I. I, I yeah. I, I, so, so I mean, uh, you're you're describing different things you can do, like keeping around one x or multiple. You know, um, and and I'm wondering if. Uh, you're describing different strategies for justifying the same actual procedure that you Ah, uh, right, okay. Yeah. Um, or if you're describing variants of a procedure that could be considered like novel versions of pseudo marginal alg algorithms that are slightly different. Yeah, so I guess when I said the first one, that would be a justification for the pseudo marginal and that you can consider a, 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 a mu and a phi that will give you the original pseudo marginal. Algorithm, but indeed, maybe I, I was uh, I got um, I got excited because I was thinking about uh, these things to do with multiple trimetropolis with stopping times, and basically you can come up with pseudo marginal algorithms with stopping times, which are not the standard pseudo marginal algorithms. So they're algorithms where you will keep sampling um, uh, new points uh, in, in until some kind of criterion is met, and you can have a valid acceptance ratio. So those are novel algorithms in some sense. And that they haven't appeared elsewhere in literature, except perhaps in my PhD thesis. Um, but in some sense, when you look at the framework, you often see that these things you see maybe more connections between some of these kinds of uh, these kinds of algorithms. If you look at pseudo marginals, often from this framework, you 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 might notice, for example, that some of what you do in the pseudo marginal scheme is you do only a partial refresh um, when you simulate according to a conditional of mu and that you could simulate more, right? And you could yeah. have somehow a more collapsed sampler or somehow, um, I'm not sure exactly what, what the correct jargon is, but you could basically do several different things. Yep, cool, yeah. thanks so much. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other question for the q and box. Um, no one, are you sure? Uh, well, let's thanks again both speakers, Christophe and Tony. That was very interesting. Thank you. I recommend also uh, to everyone uh, to also read the paper because it's, of course, uh, uh, even better if you read the paper because it's quite technical that you get the better the ideas. So that's a good advertisement for reading the paper. Read the paper now. If you're my PhD student, that's in order. <laughs> thanks again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you guys.